This video will be my hopefully conclusive review of the current state after one week of playing Le Mans Ultimate. We're going to go through the graphic settings, the sound settings, the few bugs that I had. We're going to look at the available content. I'm going to tell you which content currently is the one you really want to check out, which is the one you shouldn't care too much about. I'm going to show you how the online racing works, what is good about it, what isn't yet, what works in the menus, what doesn't. And then I think this video is hopefully giving you a good idea whether or not you want to play the game right now. Le Mans Ultimate is the first of many games that is coming out in 2024. We'll have a set of Corsa later in the year. And kind of, I feel the rain and I racing almost warrants calling it a relaunch of the game because it's going to do a major change to how I racing is played and adding a huge dynamic layer to the racing experience. And maybe we'll even see some more GT revival stuff and maybe some games in the scene will also disappear. So this is the start of 2024. Let's have a look at what we can await or what we currently have in Le Mans Ultimate. First of all, let's talk about this early access status, because I think there is well, not a misconception, but I really want to get the facts straight, kind of. A Factor 2 is the underlying base for that game. They did not start from scratch. It's very easy to see. We see make it issues or just patterns how the game work, positive or negative. These things are one to one R factor two. You can see this everywhere when you go through the game, not least when you just put the folders of both games side by side. There is virtually no difference. And a lot of files don't just have the same name, they have the exact same file size and whatnot, and everything is sorted the same. So just be clear. We are looking at something that is R Factor 2 that is not named R Factor 2, which personally, I don't think that is an actual problem. Apart from, I just think it should be said and it should be communicated openly about that. And I guess that would take a lot of wind out of the sails of potential people blaming them for selling you something of a reskin or so. Because I think generally that is fine. They probably needed a fresh start with something because it feels like our factor just didn't really have a way forward uh, to to make it like a successful title um and just the more ultimate seems to be like they have chopped up uh, chopped off a lot of the unnecessary pieces so to say of our factor made it a much more narrow game with a clear focus in terms of content and what you can actually play and removed all the modding stuff. And there were questions about if they're actually going to allow mods in the fusion. They were straight on clear on their Discord. No, this is not what we're going to do because I feel a lot of the issues of Air Factor 2 actually came from the modding capability, which is great in some sense, but it's also made the experience rather bad for everyone. And it was really tricky to just just play you know you could always play our factor too but just play it started play it it was always a bit of a mess updating content and whatnot so just to highlight that i'm not against them doing a reskin of our factor 2 and narrowing down the content to a more precise and focused product i just like them to be more open about that straightforward um and that would kind of just eradicate very easily a lot of the criticism around that. Speaking of early access, then, I would say some part here kind of, yes, justifies being early access in the sense that they probably have a new server infrastructure. Yes, there are new buttons in that game that route you through the menu and how you join the servers and all that. But generally speaking, there is already a complete working game, more or less, underneath, right? They didn't start from scratch here. And that's why I also find the early access state kind of, not necessarily by them, but by a lot of fans of the franchise is kind of used as an excuse for many issues and bugs to be there, which have already been there in Art Factor 2, which was a fully fledged game and for several years, not in early access. So that's why I find the early access status there 
a bit of a tricky thing. On the other hand, there are a few things that kind of still have trial and error, and it's important to get it out in front of the people to use it in masses with a huge amount of different PCs and hardware. Necessarily, issues will come up. But yeah, it's a bit of a double-edged sword there with the early access. It seems like when they released it, they were very aware there are going to be a lot of problems now getting the game in front of a huge variety in hardware and setups and whatnot. So they set up a Discord, which is very much focused on helping people along and trying to explain things, this and that. Um, they've been very active there on the Discord. They almost always respond immediately. They took a bit of a break this weekend, but throughout the week, there was probably any time of day there was somebody available who would either help you directly or direct you to a thread where the issue you have was already mentioned, potentially with um, a solution to the problem. This was also the case for me. Initially, initially I downloaded the game, tried to start it, didn't take me half a lap until the game crashed, uh, figured out quite a few things to get the sorted. So if you start with a game, you download it, be aware, be sorry, be prepared, there will be issues. So probably worth joining the Discord right away. And whenever you come across something, I'm fairly sure that the issue you have has already been either recognized or even addressed. Which also just brings me to kind of my personal bug list. My main issues were the game does not really like if you run MSI after burner and I had just very, very tiny bit of undervolting running, nothing aggressive, which apparently seems to have been already enough for the game to consistently crash a couple meters out of the pit box. But it was immediately solved, just turning MSI Afterburner off, uh, turning off the Reva statistics server, and then the game for the most part was running. The other main issue that made the experience rather trash was a very laggy menu. We're talking about the menu being very low FPS, but also just not recognizing or seemingly not recognizing your click. So you click on something um, like in the setup, but then the value doesn't refresh. And I just had to go alt tab in and out of the game for the display to refresh, which is completely unusable, let's face it. But if you just set the FPS limiter in the settings JSON, uh, JSON which you'll find in the game folder uh, and set it low enough, the issue seems to be that there is no headroom for the GPU to actually render the menu. If you're not capping the FPS, it just keeps rendering the game at full beans um, and leaves no room to actually sort the menu out. And if you cap the FPS low enough, in my case, that's 100, as low as 120 to get a kind of smooth uh, menu experience. Once you've done that, most of the issues are already sorted. There are quite a few bits with um, game not loading into the session, people dropping in and out. Um, there's a huge issue list, so if you come across that, best place for that is to go to the Discord. But my main things were the game crashing due to third-party software or simply sorting the menu out because of the FPS not being capped in the JSON. What you'll also see there is the... Jason or all the Jasons the game offers to edit something outside of the game's menus, it is very much affected too. So this is just where you see the heritage of the game being one-to-one -one affector. But again, not an issue as long as they figure out to give us value in terms of a game to play. Let's now actually take a look at the game and start with the menu. It all starts with you're either online or offline, offline being a race weekend. So let's maybe start there real quick. The first thing you'll notice is you don't just have a mode where you say, let me just quickly join the track with a car. So what we just call a practice mode. You just have this race weekend mode right now where you'll have to select the track, then you'll have to select the class, the car, and do quite a few settings for the event. You'll have to make sure you only run the practice session unless you also want a qualifying or race, which by default or active. There are several classes active as well. And then there is, a, you can hold the entire weather progression. 
uh, I just personally would like to have a bit of a, a much like faster mode to actually get on track. So right now it's either going online, joining a practice session, and it's just a lot of clicks, a lot of loading time before you can actually get driving. Um, so it would be appreciated if we were able to just have a very normal practice where we are by 100% alone on the track, because in the race we can hear this is like never the case. And I feel this kind of just makes it a bit complicated to actually get started, right? The initial things when you start the game is just go on the track and then do all your settings and test around a bit. And here you kind of also have to fight the menu first, first before you actually get to the first driving. And there's like 10 other things that you need to take care of without just or without just being able to let's just put me on the track please just me the car the track and and let's sit here for an infinite practice session so it's always always forced to go through a lot of settings or go online uh which i feel there needs to be a quick access of sorts instead if we go to online you always have these loading animation. It already drives me crazy. It would be good if we just had snappy menus instead of having this, this pause in between, but that's small stuff. But let's say if you're playing this game for the five, 6,000 hours that I've played ACC, you can kind of do the math how long of the time you'll be spending watching that loading animation. So just be aware there. So we all already, this is the online view that you have. I have the silver rank, which uh, gives me access to the beginner races, the intermediate races. I cannot race the advanced races. The main difference is in beginner class, everything is fixed setup with either the GTE or LMP2 class. Intermediate will be the first class needing the silver rank of safety rating to allow you to actually drive the LMDH, LMH, whatever you want to call the class. It's a bit of a mixture online. Uh, so it needs at least 10, 11 online races around that if they're all really clean to level up the safety rating to be able to drive this class uh, online. Then you need gold for to kind of unlock the non-fixed setup and multi-class series, like entire all the classes. Then we have the uh, second view, which is just the schedule, which gives you an overview of both beginner class races, which is, you see, a prototype fixed, which is the LMP2, and the GTE class fixed setup. And then going to the intermediate, you'll see there is a multi-class fixed. Uh, which is GTE and LMP2, and there is Hypercar fixed. I like the, the whole fixed setup approach. I think it takes something out of the equation for everything to start with because they're already learning a new game and everything else. And just adding setup in that makes it probably overwhelming. So I think it's a smart choice to start these two lower safety rating classes uh, without custom setups, which will come into play in the advanced section where they also have two races. You see, in each of these um, well, classes, or um, whatever they call it, you have two events. But here on the page where you actually sign up, you always only see one per class, and that switches every hour along with the schedule here, which is, I don't know, a bit weird. Not sure. I guess they were trying to simplify, but for me, it also just takes away some information if you started the first time it's not quite clear that there's actually something different happening in this class every hour so it's a bit of a communication thing with the user here there are a couple more races from the two tabs on the very top here but you only see them when you're in the the weekly races where you then won't have the schedule tab anymore so if you want to know how that takes place you just have to click on it and you have another loading animation and then it will tell you it starts tomorrow 3 30 a.m okay then if you go back we can check the same for the special event so there's weekly races and special events which i guess happen even rarer again on the first page you will not get much information so you have to do another click to get to the actual information then it shows it's starting 21 o'clock, I guess, today. Nobody has registered yet, 
and I can't myself because I think registration only opens like one hour ahead of time, which I guess if you're new to the game would be a crucial information to put on this screen as well. Um, but yeah, game seems to be early stage in a lot of aspects. One being communication between what the game wants you to do, what you can do, when you can do it. That's some improvement to do, certainly in that area. If you then decide to take part in the race, you will just go to this view again, hit register, um, choose a car and sign up. Then you'll see the countdown until the service starts. You just click join by the time it allows you. And for the most part, this uh, works more or less flawlessly. Until the race starts, you have the option to join practice service. Um, have to do the same thing again, choose a car, blah, blah, blah. Uh, BOP is horrendous currently. Basically, if you care in going fast for the race win, it has to be the Ferrari currently. But then you just hit join practice and you can select between a few servers. On the first couple of days, there weren't enough, but now it seems like they're booting up as many servers as there is demand. So also that part seems to, for the most part now, work and you're pretty much able to play any time of day when the uh, race is scheduled. Because if there is no race schedule, I'm not actually sure if practice servers are running, which forces you to go into the single player, which for me personally just had a few too many clicks when you just want to actually get to driving, practice all on your own, and you don't need AI around you to mess up your laps or whatever. Since we're doing sim racing, most of the things in these games is quite complex and there are usually a lot of options. So if you go to the settings, there's two ways to actually get there from the main menu. There's a button or there's always a button at the top you can reach from pretty much anywhere else where you're in the game, be it on track or anywhere else on the menu. Like this top part here is always going to be there. I hope it's not hidden by the camera. No. Um, the menu will not visually remind you of R Factor, R Factor 2, but just the sheer amount of settings, options in here is going to be quite overwhelming for anybody not already familiar with R Factor 2. Basically, there are a lot of options. Not all of them have tooltips. A lot of them that don't definitely need it. Um, there is one layer, I guess the, the whole gameplay part is is okay that is there is some overview here but once you get to controls there is another layer and there's another layer so it's like a three layered menu just for the control settings and it can be a bit overwhelming and there are indeed a few options missing not in terms of what you need to adjust in the game or what you need a button for but you're actually limited what you can't put into these uh, function here, what you can bind. And in, in iRacing, you're completely free to do whatever. Just press any key combination you want to kind of trigger that functionality. So you have, in theory, endless, almost endless buttons on your wheel. You can press any key combination and with 10 keys that gives you, what, 100 options or something. Plus you can add more shift keys or you can do triple or quadruple combinations in iRacing, which gives you a ton of options to put on your steering wheel. In ACC, you have the option to define a shift key, which just gives you kind of a second set of buttons to use. And you also have the long press functionality in ACC, which I kind of like the most because it's a really smart and intuitive way to give you more functionality. So on one button in ACC, you'd have at least three control options. Um, and this is entirely missing here in the more ultimate. You have no shift key, no key combinations you can press, and you don't have something like a long press, which just means you're quickly running out of buttons. The issue here is that with the LMH, LMDH class, the cars have a lot of functionality. You want to adjust the roll bars, the brake bias, the brake migration. You have a energy recovery setting. You have a engine map setting, you have three traction controls to manage. Um, so this alone would be like eight rotaries or something that you want to use. And if you just had these shift and lung press options or any combination, possibly, 
that would allow you to put a lot more on your wheel you actually need while driving. So currently you're just forced to use the HUD basically up and down arrows to shift through the menus and adjust everything because I doubt you will have or find enough buttons on your wheel. Um, that said, I think there isn't actually too much to set up apart from the major buttons you'll need. And I also didn't really have to fiddle with any settings for the steering wheels or pedals. Everything was more or less working. Um, also in the force feedback pod, there are quite a few settings, but I think for the most part, you can ignore the, your main thing should be here, the force feedback strength. Just go to the maximum in your wheel driver and then dial it down here to avoid any type of clipping. What works for me in the VRS is setting it to like 16 newton meters and then going 80% in the game. I think I have everything else untouched apart from the collision strength, which somehow is set to 150%, which I find a bit risky on the direct drive. So just dial that back in case you hit someone or something to not break your wrist, wrists. Um, and I think you can then pretty much ignore the rest for the time being. Just make sure you set your wheel range correctly, which for me, the game did kind of automatically. I have the driver on 900 degrees, have this on 900 degrees, and then you just click this on, use steering wheel range from vehicle, and it will automatically adapt to what the car has. And you shouldn't have to worry about it, um, which might be different for Thrustmaster users because they do things differently for whatever reason. So um, in general, a bit overwhelming, a lot of options. Most of them you will not need, though. Make sure to find buttons to adjust the seat in the game, which is your way to adjust the camera in the car forward, upward, if you need that to adjust your view and the field of view. And the other thing that bugged me a bit in the beginning was that there were standard bindings for uh, a lot of things like car control was a primary here. There were a lot of buttons set to drive the car with the keyboard. And every time I alt tabbed out of the game, it was just shifting down or doing whatever with the car. So make sure to unbind all the keys, basically, so your car doesn't suddenly do weird stuff you didn't expect. Just a quick word about the graphic settings. Uh, as you know, I'm running on a 49-inch ultrawide. That's my native resolution. Um, and I usually have the option to go 60 hertz or 240, so I choose the 240. It's sad that the turning vertical sync on or off, depending on who you ask, is going to reduce the menu lag once you're in the session. It's usually fine when you're just in the normal menu, everything will work. But once you're in a session with other cars and your GPU is running 99%, that's why you put the FPS cap in the JSON, uh, the menu doesn't actually have a lot of resources left to be rendered. Um, so it also helps just running lower graphic settings to create GPU headroom for that. VSync seems to play some role. Um, either way, let's just make sure how you could probably run it. Of course, all your hardware is going to be different, but the most taxing effects are post effects, um, full scene anti-aliasing, and I believe it was the environment reflection which were causing the most impact on performance. Everything else on my 3080 Ti, I could usually easily run on high or even ultra and would still get fairly a fair bit above 100 in FPS. But because I'm um, eSports kind of guy, we want as many FPS as we, as we want. So I just run settings a little lower than I possibly could. And then I cap them in the JSON to 120 just right now to, to get it all working. That could be more fine tuning than probably, but I just want to have the game run. I want to have the menu usable. Uh, so these are the things I'm doing. Additionally, I get hints from Affect2 kind of experts who were saying just the number of effects and audio can cause issues if they're set to the default of 256. Uh, so I load them to 64 by their suggestion. And there's virtually no difference in sound whatsoever, but the game might bug out less. Um, then there is something like this, uh, which just misses a proper description. So I have no clue what it actually does. Uh, but that should be it for the graphics and sound part. We just want to get onto the track now.
Now, if we create an offline single player session, we are confronted with a question of cars. And I think here is my first main point I want to make, not necessarily positive or negative. It's just that the GTE cars, and I drove them back and forth between Alpha Factor 2 and Le Mans Ultimate, and there's virtually no, there's no difference, okay? Let's just agree on there is no difference. Maybe someone will come around the corner and say, but they changed this and that and this and whatever. It feels the exact same. It drives the same. It sounds the same. It does the same. The only real difference you have is that you have different tracks. So if you're into the GTE class and you're happy with the track selection, you have an Alpha Factor 2, you do not need this game right now unless you want to drive online because here you actually have populated online sessions but driving wise don't expect anything new it is the same the same kind of goes for the lmp2 um just that in uh, this is the orica i believe that we have here and in our factor 2 we have the ligier and the orica uh, where i found the ligier to drive i think nicer um uh, the class is kind of all right but same thing goes here if you're happy with the track selection selection now factor 2 um, and the tracks we have here don't any, add anything extra for you, then you probably don't need the game. Apart from, you might have populated online sessions uh, pretty much at your fingertips. So this is what kind of justifies this being in here. The true new thing in this game, though, is, and where it also is kind of set apart from anything else, is the hypercar class, because here now we have seven cars that we don't get in this variety in any other game. iRacing has three or four or something. Uh, Automobilista has a few, but none of them has kind of the full range from Cadillac to the Ferrari to the Glickenhaus is nowhere. Maybe there's an AC1 mod or so. Uh, the Peugeot, I believe it's just nowhere. The Porsche, I know we have an iRacing, of course, and also an Automobilista. The Toyota, I believe, is unique to Le Mans Ultimate. And the Van Vol is in R Factor 2 already, which I guess is a port. Maybe they did some changes, um, but that card does not interest me. I'll cut it short here a bit. You will want to drive the Ferrari. Um, we'll probably get to more detail of that and why that is. Uh, but I can tell you that the driving experience of the Ferrari is, I feel, vastly different from all the others we have here right now um so this is what we're going to use for the remainder of this uh, video pretty much circuit wise we have seven tracks as well from sebring to portugal uh spa can't miss in any game there is uh Le Mans, of course there's monza there's the fuji speedway which is actually a nice track really wide allows for good racing and we have bahrain I'm not actually sure what I'm going to use for this. I have decided to go with Monza because I've been driving that early and I think it's the current uh, fixed setup series. And just important here, I think if you want to do practice, it's probably better to not have the other classes. So make sure to turn them off. Uh, in the practice session, I've set the weather. Just you have five weather slots here, uh, which are going to go through the entirety here, depending how long your session is. I think the default is an hour. I haven't tinkered with it yet. Um, just easiest is probably just set one of the presets and then we're good. I haven't dabbled with the entire weather thing yet. Just I had a short wet run, but it's too early to really talk about that. So that is on. And now we hit start the race week and nothing else really I need to set here. Um, and then we'll spend some time waiting, especially when you start the game the first time, the loading times are going to be quite a bit longer, um, I guess, because some of the shaders or whatever are then just going to be stored for the next time you run the game. And then the loading times should become a little shorter. It's um, a rather fresh um, Italy or Italy <laughs> Monza scan, uh, which you'll see that the track is quite... Bumpy, has a lot of undulations, and actually matters 
during braking, especially approaching Ascari, where just in the middle of the braking zone and really just about when the car loses the downforce, so when you're quite slow already, you're going over quite the bump, which um, forces you to be very careful on the brakes there. But we'll see this once we get to the driving because there is still much more to say. Um, first thing is here you have the standings which shows you all the drivers in the session and it's the same online a couple infos here and then you go to life timing which has the same information plus the sector times but nothing else really uh, the only thing that the standings have is that it kind of repeats that it's a practice session that it takes 60 minutes uh, and we also have the air temperature which we also have up here behind my camera uh, the only information we didn't have in the lifetiming basically is the track temperature, rain, and wetness. So these are kind of redundant right now, and I don't see why you need two screens for that unless they have more plans as to what they want to do here. You can also not expand your, like, if uh, earlier I did 30 laps or something. And then I wanted to see how my lap time progression was and I could only see my fastest and my last lap and the sectors, but I could not click on anything to expand and see the entire list of laps that I was doing and it wasn't working in any of this here as well. So it was at least a bit weird. When we go into the setup, we have a bit more menu shenanigans, I was going to say. Um... <clears throat> And it starts with you go to the setup and you get like a yeah kind of quick setting screen where you only have the, the tire available and the tire pressure. As far as I remember in R Factor, you always set the minimum pressure. I don't know how it is in the rain, but so this is basically useless. And then you can just switch the tire compound. Okay, if that is the most important thing, we don't know that yet, then maybe this is good. Um, but if you go to the actual setup, you're going to click on car setup and then you click on advanced setup because they made a second menu with just kind of a few what they think are important settings. I don't know why the water radiator and oil radiator cover are so important settings. They need to be kind of presented to you before anything else in the setup. I mean, yes, the rear wing could be one of the things you change more quickly during the initial testing, but it's nothing you change later on when you fine-tune the setup, so I don't know. Virtual energy is indeed a weird one, and what's also missing in these quick menus here, so to say, is the, the tooltip, because I think virtual energy is something that is new to sim racers, so I think it needs explaining. However, we need to go one more, one level deeper into the actual setup, which is the advanced setup, and now the problem is you can't get back to those two initial screens that we just had. So if I click on setup, it's not taking us back. And the back button here takes us out of the session. So this, yeah, kind of you can go deeper into the menu, but you can't go out of the layers again, uh, except for starting over, which you do by not clicking on setup, but you go back to the lifetiming or standings, then you go back to the setup, and then you go to the car setup, and then you go to the advanced setup, and then you are in the actual setup where you can do some file management, which I think works fine. Just, yeah, kind of looks like a new interface compared to the other games I dabble with. Um, and then we can go through the settings. Power drain is going to be an important one, and I'm not sure I'm hiding uh, the tooltip here with the camera. I probably am to some degree. So I'll just read it out. Adjust the virtual energy level for your race. Virtual energy represents the power generated by your car's combustion engine and electric hybrid system. This energy dictates how long you can remain on the track without refueling. Blah, 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 blah. Important thing here. Setting virtual energy to 100% will automatically load your car with a maximum fuel capacity. It does not change my fuel. And if I set it to 100, so which is what the text says, and I go lower on the fuel, whatever, and I hit start driving, then you'll see it does actually not set my fuel to the maximum amount. So the tooltip is kind of wrong. So we went to the track, now we want to go back to the setup. So it's another one, two, three clicks until we're actually in the setup, four until we are where we left off last time around. 
Um, I'm not sure this actually looks like the preset setup, but we're not going to touch it for the time being. My earlier run I did with 50 liters, so that's what we're going to set and ignore what the virtual energy actually does. Then you can see the car has three TC settings, which I have also spoken about earlier. Um, you have to see the, the first one seems to be the longitudinal TC and the slip angle seems to be the lateral uh, TC. So basically this one you can probably ignore for or well, go very low because usually uh, longitudinally there is no issue. It's very loud. Um, but of course, uh, when you go onto the power exiting the corner, you still have lateral load. This is where this is going to be the key setting we're going to adjust, if at all. And then the power cut defines how hard the interference of the TC is, just to explain these three levels. The region level defines how much regeneration you're going to do under braking, how quickly your battery recharges. Um, and then you have the motor map, which decides how much the electric engine is going to provide. This is not on top of the ICE engine. This is just how much kind of it um, amends the ICE engine or takes away from the ICE. So your total power output is going to be unchanged regardless of the setting. You basically just use these two settings to level out um, your energy efficiency over the stint to kind of you Probably it's going to be around running as less fuel or as little fuel as possible to have a light car and then regenerate as much energy as you can um, and kind of just try to manage with a lighter car throughout the race. And then you're going to balance these two values in order for there always to be battery available and the battery to kind of never be full. Initially, I thought the system is much more complex, but I think it all comes down to what I just said, but we'll probably have a couple um, LMU specialists already, hopefully from the beta testers that could maybe add to what I um, just mentioned here. But the important thing for you is this is not a boost. This is just the amount of electric energy within your maxed out energy that the car is going to have, which is, I think, something actually, I don't know, something like 600 horsepower. I'm probably wrong. It's probably more. I think it's 500 kilowatts or something. I checked the numbers earlier, I forgot. Um, so this just tells you from, let's say it's 500, 80 kilowatts of those 500 will come from the electric engine, but it's also just between a specific range of speed, which varies a bit per car, lots of detail, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think this is the main thing you need to know about what is unique about these hybrids we are going to race for the majority of time. I think wheel and brace, I'm actually not going to touch much here. There's something called brake migration, which might be new to a couple sim races, which uh, has no description available. Uh, how it works in iRacing is the more you press the pedal, the more the brake bias moves forward. I'm not sure it works the same way here. Uh, I guess we'll figure it out at a later point. Um, and just with that tooltip they're kind of missing brings me to the point that there's a lot in this game I feel that is missing. Um, <clears throat> because these cars I find are rather complex at least compared to the standard uh, GT3 that is driven so so much across sim racing or Mazda MX-5 or whatever is driven in the lower level um, or the very popular series that I find the tooltips here really are crucial when they are aiming to expand the audience that is uh, playing their title. So there will be a lot of people who are not familiar with the technical details of these classes. And I feel they need to do quite a lot of explaining of a lot of stuff to kind of reduce the complexity again of this entire class in order for yeah, being approachable to new players who might have come from either not as in-depth simulations from other classes or simply just having done road racing or sim -cates or whatever. Um, and I feel they really need to think about who is going to play their game um, and what information these need to, people need to, yeah, get along with this game and get started quickly because you can't expect people to know the rule book of WEC or IMSA 
in order to understand what this is all about. Like, just it surprised me as well, just because I didn't really, or I don't really watch a lot of real life motorsport, and because I don't read the rule books of these series, um, I only do it for the videos. Where you then know, okay, ah, okay, this region does something entirely different. The engine map doesn't actually uh, give you additional power. So there's a bit of, I feel, a chance for confusion that they kind of could solve before people get confused by just explaining the whole thing. And maybe this is something they actually need to do at the very start of the game, um, explaining the hyperclass a bit more in detail. Um, then I think we don't have to actually touch anything here. Uh, the spring rate is somehow presented to you in millimeters. So this is also something where like, we probably have to check what this actually means and does. I guess lower is softer. I get that potentially, but it's a weird way to express the spring rate, especially when you call it spring rate in millimeters or I'm not enough of an engineer to know better. What else do we have? Uh, I think here we can skip the rest and actually start some driving. Inside the car then, uh, things hopefully get a little easier. Uh, we have the, the button, uh, sorry, the, the menu at the bottom left is going to be important. So quickly let's cycle through. This is, I guess, what we know. We just see the kind of life delta to the cars around us. And then we go into this direction. We'll see weather information, the time, uh, and some of our cuts and penalties are tracked. Okay. Then we will have something with the lap times. It shows the target the best in the current. No list of lap times, though. Uh, then we have information about the tires and what you can see here, and that is a unique thing in the um, LMDH class as well. as They do not have tire warmers here. So you're starting with, well, not exactly ambient temperature. Ambient is... 27 if i get that right and the tires are well a little under 27 the tarmac is a bit hotter the um that kind of temperature seems to sink into the brakes weirdly but not sink into the tire as you can see the temperature of the tires is dropping the temperature of the brakes is increasing right now i'm sure there's a reason for that but i just sat here earlier looking at that and was a bit confused as what is happening doesn't seem severe as it's not going up to 100 or something, but for whatever reason, the brakes do get warmer when you stand in the pits. Uh, then tire wear, I think, is going to be a crucial thing. What else do we have? There is a bit of a fuel calculator, which to me seemed like it's working, but we probably have to check a bit again how it all works out with the electric energy that we can also use. Uh, then we have the electronics symbolized by the Thunderbolt. And then we have the TC settings. We have adjustable roll bars in the cockpit. And uh, we have the brake bias, the migration, the engine map of the electric power unit, the regen level, and there is a lap target, which has no explanation whatsoever because it's not in the setup screen and so it can't have a tooltip. So it's just there. Um, somebody on an earlier stream said that this is about um, kind of telling the car how much uh, fuel you want to save how many laps and then the dash is going to show you when you need to start the coasting um, and then afterwards the braking there are going to be da uh, lights on the wheel indicating that so you can kind of lift and coast a little to save energy um, and that is what this setting does but again i think it needs explanation and it shouldn't be me doing that uh, and then there's a pit stop menu where just, yeah, we can serve a penalty, we can repair damage, uh, we want to refill virtual energy. Uh, needs explanation, I feel. Uh, the fuel, tires, and um, which tire, apparently, but it doesn't, oh, there's also the tire pressure. So it's also a bit of weirdly sorted that you get the kind of the tire compound. Then you have the wing, uh, the grill, which... I don't know what it is because I've not seen it in the setup screen. And then we have the tire pressures and replace brakes, yes or no. I don't actually know why I would want to replace brakes because I think in the setup screen I saw nothing about brake wear, but that might be on me. Uh, I shall check later. So now let's go out. And the first thing, the most important thing that we're going to watch is 
go out easy because the car is it, it's super slippery on cold tires you have basically no zero grip is a stretch you have less so we're going to go really slow the first couple laps because it really takes some time to get the tires up to temperature and until then it also really is advised to not really touch um, the electronic settings because it's just going to make your life a little harder. So that's why I said earlier now we're just going to share the track with some AIs because there is no known practice session available so far so we have to take care of the others a bit and they have to take care of us. I wonder if we just fast forward from here a bit to bring you a car that has warmed up tires because in this phase really there isn't too much to talk about. All right, I did two more laps now and the screen is not frozen. I have just paused the game, which is something actually nice. You just press the P key in my case and the simulation will pause and the button is actually, or well, the function is called that and the, everything just becomes stationary and it works. So you can see the tires are warmed up a little, so they're kind of getting towards the operating range. In the menu, it says for the medium tire, I think 90 degrees. Uh, I've never been close to that. I get them a little over 80 here, um, but I think there was an earlier online practice session where the air temperature was like 15. Now we have 27, so we might actually make the over 90 degrees, which we shall see. Um, I fast forwarded to this, but because the tire cold is really not usable and you will see in the first couple laps, your lap time is just going to become faster and faster as the tire heats up. Um, I guess there's kind of a balance somewhere with the initial wear of the tire, but it does not seem like the wear is happening quicker than, or let's say the tire doesn't lose grip fast enough from wearing, then it gains grip from heating up. So it could well be that your quickest lap will be four or five laps into the run, which kind of makes qualifying interesting strategy wise. Now, I think we just want to do some driving and get a feeling for what we have to do as drivers here. As you can see, we are well halfway through the straight. We're already nearly doing 300. So these cars are powerful and very fast. The braking points are similar to GT3 as a rough reference. And then you probably just add 10, 20 meters to it or something. It depends a bit on the corner and the very high downforce um, braking zones we are more similar to the GT3. The slower the corner becomes or the slower the straight is on which we're braking, I feel the longer the braking zone becomes compared to the GT3. So just in general, what you want to take away is brake earlier than the braking points you know from the GT3s, GTEs, and I think even the LMP2. These cars are really fast um, and a bit heavy. So braking is going to be, there's just a nice line here at 160 meters. We're going to slam it. And then as we go slow, we trail a bit, but especially as soon as we steer, we're going to have to be very careful on the brake there. Upshifting, very interesting. Don't max out the gear. You will not have any more power up there. I wait for the first or second red light on the wheel which sadly does not really correspond with the red lights you'll see here on the red side in the HUD. Not quite, right? There is some correlation, but yeah, not quite. And I think it differs uh, a bit per car. So don't go by the red lights, I'd say, on the HUD. You will have to probably figure out per car where the optimal shift point is. In this case here, the Ferrari actually likes to be short shifted and you can see it in the Delta. It, so first red light should be enough for you and you can trail really deep and the one thing I can really feel is that sometimes you are kind of on purpose going what feels to be too quick into the corner because it allows you to utilize the downforce a tiny bit longer and actually break longer and harder into the corner so it's a bit of a weird driving where 
it seems we're stepping away a bit in a couple corners from the principle of slow in, fast out, but rather something like fast in and well, somehow out. But the fast in has so many gains due to the the added downforce in this section that you can yeah kind of produce lap time that way. And on corner exit, you're actually going you're naturally going to be a bit slower, so you're not having as much downforce, and the car has quite a bit less grip and it feels like just pushing into the downforce corners a bit harder can give more lap time than driving it kind of the, the classic way which I find is quite interesting. There's also a drastic difference in car behavior between when you have corners with a lot of downforce so a lot of speed and when you have corners that are very slow. As a rough separator between the two anything slower than third gear i will call mechanical grip corner and everything from third or above is going to be more uh, aero dominated corner and you really drive two different cars around and i feel the aero part or the high downforce part the fast corners this is where the game becomes really interesting and where it gives you a great feeling and good connection with the car you have good first feedback where it indicates kind of the load that is sitting on the tire by becoming a bit heavier and gives you a really good connection to the car but when you're in the slow speed corners then the car is kind of mechanically dominated there's no downforce acting on the car and the cars get really really sensitive and you have to do really low level trailing and be careful on the throttle because there's very little traction available especially of course when you want to produce the lap time you just can't claw the throttle like you're maybe used to in gt3s for example and i feel there's a um, quite yeah as i said a, a drastic difference between these two situations the car is in kind of so definitely a downforce corner here and entry we can really push with a lot of speed find the minimum speed in the corner really really late so this is also quite a difference i feel to the typical gt3 driving where, where, that i do where normally you have the slowest speed close to or before the apex and you're actually already accelerating through the apex to build good straight line speed and in these cars as i said it seems to matter to push with a bit more speed into the corner to keep the downforce for longer and you'll have a bit more grip somewhat of the kind of idea that sometimes gets mentioned around formula one where supposedly the driver gets scared of a corner goes slow and doesn't make it and then the engineer tells the driver you have to go faster then you're producing more downforce and you will make the corner and i feel this is somewhat of the perception <laughs> i'm i'm getting here so let's take a look at the mechanical grip and how low it is here in the first corner turning down the tc a bit though it's just the longitudinal one just to give you a feeling how deep I was not giving a lot of throttle, it was maybe 50% or something and the car is just completely unable to put it somehow into the ground. The TC engages heavily, saves me and yeah, takes away all the power there from acceleration. So there's really some cautious or some caution is needed in all the slow driving, all the mechanically dominated driving. And you can be quite harsh with the car in the faster corners. You will still feel you can't throw it around as much. We'll see this in Ascari with the weight changes. We we'll still have to be very gentle with the steering wheel. We shouldn't make uh, very fast direction changes because the rear is definitely going to get loose here. And I can just barely keep it on the road there. And now when we turn here, and if I throw it to the right, then we immediately lose the rear. And if I throw it to the left there, it would happen. Uh, equally so very little steering is going to be enough here and it seems like there's always enough of inertia on the rear axle in any driving situation to kind of kick the rear and lose and also here on throttle even out of the parabolica you need to feed in the throttle a tiny bit you can't just slam it because you will simply not have enough grip 
Let me try to speed it up. The tire temperatures seem actually all right by now. And that can be, as you can see, I'm, I'm quite aggressive on the brake there initially for quite a while. But as soon as I'm going to like third or second gear or something, I really have to be easier on the brake as the grip just becomes a lot less with the downforce disappearing. Gotta be careful with the sausages and here on exit just feeding it in over let's say half a second to a second same thing here what's kind of nice is you can get sort of a lock up and you just about hear the tire screen noise there but the tire will recover so it's not like eye racing where once you lock up the tire will kind of infinitely lock up but it will come back to you in a way. So and making tiny errors on the brake is not actually a big issue. Of course, you'll heat it up, cause flat spots that you'll later feel in the steering wheel as quite brutal vibration. So yeah, avoid that. But there is room for error, so to say. At least it won't send you off the track right away as long as just a tiny lockup. The other thing that you might have already noticed but we haven't spoken about yet is that there is, I feel in the Ferrari there's quite some detail, right? That's why I'm explaining so much to the driving, but also you can hear it under braking and just the kind of noise variation we have from the electric uh, regeneration that the car is doing and it really kind of responds directly to your brake input to the tire grip and the noise is never just the same, just listen to it. I feel this This is such nice detail there in the sound. And so much variation that you feel really, I don't know, it feels like you just have a really nice connection and the car is super responsive to everything that you're doing, everything the car is experiencing from the track or the tires slipping and all that. And that feels, it just feels good in a way. And if you watch the onboards of the real car, you'll kind of hear the same thing, the amount of variation in the regeneration. The faster you go, the more you can send it over the curbs, the more stable the car becomes. So once you're fourth gear, there's really very little to be scared about. The car's going to be rather planted. The issue only is that the Ferrari, to me, felt like the only car where this amount of detail is available. The other cars can sound good as well, but I feel they don't have as much uh, variety in their behavior. They don't respond to as many things and they don't respond as, as detailed as the Ferrari does here. And um, so I was lucky enough to talk to uh, one of the one of the testers of the Ferrari from the esports team who are quite involved with uh, Art Factor in general. Oh, he's fighting in a practice session. Okay, we're, we're gonna just go side by side here, I guess. It's teammate. Um, and what he said basically is that Ferrari was really keen on getting the car well represented in the game and they put in a lot of effort to actually do this, provide a lot of data, did a lot of testing with the esports drivers and even the real drivers. And I don't know, I, I don't know how much effort was put in to the other cars because I couldn't speak of any or couldn't speak with anybody involved. But just driving the other cars, you will very quickly feel they are just not as, as detailed. They don't give you as many levels of feedback and um, that kind of made me think just how important it is for or how much we sim racers depend on manufacturers wanting to give us a good experience because it's not just down to the developers of the game trying to do their best in the end modeling real life cars they depend on having enough information available and feedback to actually make a good representation of these cars. Um, 
And this is kind of where I'm gonna say I, I beg all the manufacturers to take sim racing as serious as they can and just try to give us good experiences by providing as much data and feedback and testing as they can somehow manage because the more they add, the better we will perceive their cars in the game, the more we'll enjoy the experience and we'll certainly appreciate when they appreciate the experience that we want to have. I wonder if there's one more thing to say, but right now you can just see I'm driving around. I don't really have to do any energy management. I don't have to check all that. I'm really only looking at the tire. If the temperatures are somewhere there, uh, the wear doesn't seem to be excessive. We are, I don't know how many laps in, but we only use 7% of the front tires. Maybe we gotta say something about the driving in, in general. Um, and I chose the Ferrari because it's the least pronounced here, so the most detailed car I feel in the game has the least amount of driving behavioral issues that I found with the other cars, and that is kind of um, a floatiness to everything. Which, again, is the least pronounced here on the Ferrari, but you will have that on all the other cars, that it's quite easy to, very, very easy to overdrive the front axle and then kind of having a hard time figuring out where that limit of the front axle actually lies because the car and the tire feel very vague in that area and don't really give you a lot of information of how much you are doing over or under the limit. Oversteer in general, you get good feedback from the steering wheel. The only problem is that you have a tendency in most other cars to too easily go way too sideways and the car being way too floaty and acting a bit like a shopping trolley or even a trailer connected to the car. And I feel this is something we've seen in uh, Rensport, where, um, as they say, inspired by other games and how they model certain things. And we see this from Automobilista and essentially in all the easy based games or all the games that kind of come from that or origin one way or another and have a shared history in that regard. I'm actually doing a purple here. Um, and that's what, what, what I'm going to say is about the game in general. Maybe we just stop the driving here. The final thing to test for this review is going to check the online mode and how the driving actually is because I'm thinking for most people this is what it's going to be the most important part and first things first I think they have made a pretty good start here all right let's do an online race actually because that is a major part of the game that was yet missing from well the review video uh, so I signed up for what is currently the LMP2 fixed setup race on spa uh, all the races are really just 16 minutes right now i skipped the practice and qualifying for you because it wasn't that interesting um in qualifying i set the third fastest lap just had no practice before so that was pretty good but immediately made a mistake just yeah i forgot to take out fuel because it resets between every session so now i have to do a 60 16 minute race with fuel for well something like 30 40 minutes uh, quite a bit too much so the car is going to be heavy and the race will be a bit tricky for me here because once you're on the grid you can't go back to the garage the only thing you can do is retire so uh, there's nothing I can do to change that let's fast forward a bit to the race start where the only information you really get is to follow the car that is right ahead of you. And yeah, somehow just the guy ahead defines when the race starts. There's no lights whatsoever. And then the race is just suddenly on. And what I really want to highlight here is two things that you'll see in uh, later periods in the race when we'll actually try some passing or somebody tries to pass us. The detail you see of the other cars and I don't mean 
the detail on the cars, I mean the detail in the amount of movements the cars show. Uh, and I feel you can see a lot of detail there in very tiny movements the car is doing when he's clipping a curb, when the car is over rotating, under rotating. You can really see where his car is heading, where he struggles, where the car gets shoved around by the track, uh, where he's driving. And all that seems to be really accurately, accurately tracked, but also directly conveyed to everybody else driving um, around that car. So I feel you are really well informed as a driver behind as to how the car in front feels right now. Or you can definitely see quite quickly if he's developing understeer or if he's trouble having with oversteer. Um, and this, I feel, is something I'm not used to. So I'm, I'm just usually checking lap times normally to judge what somebody else is doing or sector times or similar but we don't usually see as much detail of the car ahead whether or not it's struggling in a certain area and if it's well as i said rotating too much or whatever or gets pushed wide by a curb or pulled in or something it is um, not that detailed usually in the other games right now so i feel this is something that is actually positive and really takes out here the other thing um, and that you'll surely be able to see is that the, the car contact is quite nice. It doesn't seem exaggerated. It doesn't seem um, muted, so to say. Um, I'm almost about to say that it feels quite right when you have car contact. Um, you can always keep the car on the road and you can always... <clears throat> That we go there I just get shoved from behind but I can still save the car when there's just a minor contact so it's not like where you just get a tiny tap and then the car spins uncontrollably and the same way if you hit someone else too much or someone else hits you too much that there wouldn't be any um, yeah detrimental effects like you know from race room for example where you can just send it way too hard there's a lot of contact and the cars don't really care so this seems well calibrated here but i guess i'm also driving in the morning here in eu times so i guess the pings of the cars around me will be largely similar a few things to mention is um the fuel for one thing i got wrong because we we spoke about the menu uh, the fuel amount is kind of two or three layers deep in the menu and it's somehow not the first option you can set but you can change the, the tire compound and the pressure in the rear wing, but somehow the fuel didn't seem to be one of the things making it to the kind of priority page in the setup, which is a bit odd. And the other odd thing is that it resets between sessions to the value in the fixed setup in the first place. Um, and I guess the fixed setup could also just be dialed in for the races it's been used. So the maximum fuel should be the fuel that you actually need for the race doesn't have to be a full tank so it seems they yeah just kind of didn't adapt the fix setup there to the duration of the races the main thing then is watching the tires for me just making sure i'm using them equally and not too much not having any tires step out of line too much and the other bit is the setup is a bit uh on the on the unstable side you will see once we go through rouge the next time around that as very very little steering needed and the first time i went through i nearly died and i feel this setup is only really usable for direct drive users i have to say i don't want to imagine going through a rouge with just a logitech wheel because the rear end is really loose here if you steer a tiny bit too much the rear is definitely gonna go see i'm, I'm dealing there with maybe five degrees of steering angle and it doesn't really need much more of course i have a bit of a problem following the other guy right now with the large fuel tank but i also think this is about as much as i wanted to mention the car contact being quite credible not exaggerated not um not too little maybe something about the warning system here i don't think that whatever i did there just using the cup didn't feel like it warranted a penalty however the game is very harsh and sensitive there okay i guess we'll adapt to that and the other bit was that you can see a lot of detail of the other cars. So there's a lot of information um, delivered um, through the, the net code, if you want to call it that. 
and we really know what the other car ahead is doing, how the car is behaving, how sensitive it is and where and what the other driver might be struggling with. Um, and I guess you can also see the close fighting really is nicely possible. I was a bit afraid to follow other cars closely initially because the setup was already quite loose and I was expecting some aero loss through Blanchimor for example, but it seems the effect on downforce is very little and also the slipstream effect really is small. Even doing almost 280, 290 behind another car completely in the slipstream, you barely gain any speed and passing therefore is quite difficult. You really need a speed advantage as a driver in terms of lap time, I guess, to make pass a stick if two drivers are fairly equal passing gets really tr stri um, sorry very tricky with a limited amount of slipstream there maybe one thing in the net code if you see a lot of locking up of other cars i'm not sure that is accurate maybe like the trigger for smoke is a little early with a little slip on the front tires of the other cars but that is a minor thing everything else in terms of movement where the car is going all that seems really fine um, and the racing is decent. The only thing I really miss uh, or the only thing odd maybe about the racing is that the cars are really sensitive around the limit and you easily start floating around so you really have to take a lot of care to not overdrive the tiniest bit because else you just go way wide or your car starts floating around a lot using a lot of tires and that is really the only thing you have to watch out i'd say but you can so far i'd say rely on the net code there so far in this week i didn't experience anything that was out of line really skipping forward here to the last one and a half laps it seems like he was using his tires much more so my fuel advantage or my fuel disadvantage got less over the short race already and I had it easier following him and catching up and I had another go around the outside this time through the chicane because the over under just didn't work so I tried to hang it around the outside there was a bit of contact again nothing exaggerated here I guess this was completely fine for both of us and I took the position here but with the excess amount of fuel I'm just not able to accelerate away and yep I wasn't defending so he stuck his nose up in the inside and made it work. Then out accelerates me with the lighter car and I couldn't do anything in the slipstream here. However, I hope this was kind of showing you what the cars allow in terms of contact, how you can see the other cars move and there's a lot of detail. There doesn't seem to be any lag, jittering, stuttering or anything. Everything seems very smooth in terms of netcode, which I think for a game that looks like it's focusing a lot on the online part and being in early stages here really is one of the positives i wanted to highlight uh, let's quickly jump through to the end screen of the race and one thing i notice is that once you've really left the track and go back to the menu the chat function is just not available anymore so you can't even say well, i don't know thank you good race whatever nice fight there's no way to contact other people and also just in timing and standings you can't really i don't see anything else than the last lap the fastest lap and where everybody finished but you can't kind of unfold um all the laps that were done or see some progress or anything so this is so far really basic time for a little conclusion then uh, when you made it this far, one hour into the video, I first I hope you liked it. And then again, I think the, the game is doing a good job in a few areas already and a not so good job in quite a few others. What sticks out to me is the netcode does to really allow for close racing. There is a lot of information transmitted of the other cars around you. Car contact is very reliable, not exaggerated and not too little. Then the positive part is also that the online racing for the most part just works. There was a few hiccups in the beginning. Uh, there weren't too many practice sessions available, but this seems to be sorted out. There is a little bit of an issue though, kind of accessing 
the online part and really knowing which race is on when just all takes a bit too few clicks and could all probably be communicated a little more efficiently, effectively, leaving a few questions kind of um, faster answered without you having to go to the Discord or something. Um, then what was also positive, I feel, is the Ferrari in particular that really sticks out in terms of how it behaves. There is a lot of detail available to the car behavior, but we also saw there are some issues in particular with the menu in general, the user interface, the user experience, how you access the game. And this really just reminds me of what I always never really liked about R Factor 2, that we are ending up with the same conclusion being like, yes, it's a good simulation underneath, potentially, but it's hard to access it and the menu isn't really the, the greatest of things. And we have a game with great potential. And I really hope that we don't end up saying the same thing for the more ultimate for infinity of time, that it has so much potential that it isn't used, because I think it is generally there with reducing the game's content to just a few classes, a few tracks, it really makes it much more accessible for everybody because you know what to expect. You don't have to worry about ma managing your content and getting the updates and doing adjustments here and there. So I guess there is something that makes it already better than R Factor 2 in terms of that you actually find people to play online. Pretty much every time a session is on, it's going to be filled with people. I just took part in one of the earliest sessions on the day and it just worked and there were enough cars. But there are also the same issues that just make it a little painful. Something's not working, the menu being laggy. Yes, you can somehow figure it out and maybe they're going to patch it. But all the information that is delivered to you, how you access the game, which settings you really need to address, what some settings actually do, the sorting of the menus, the different layers going only one direction through the menu, but you can't go the other way without starting ahead from the very start, is all still a bit uh, weird and seems un unfinished and not thought through entirely, so to say. Um, but they're making a great effort offering support in the Discord, so you have to give them credit for that, I think. And then I'm just hoping they're not making the same mistakes as they did in R Factor 2, just kind of relying they had a good or relying on they have a good simulation underneath in general, but kind of not producing a good game. And this is the area I think where they need to focus a lot on. But it also seems like they are now able to focus a lot on that because the main parts of the game, which I feel is the online racing, already works quite consistently, quite smoothly. Overall, I didn't have many problems apart from the first few days. So there's a real positive here. You can play the game and the driving has bits and pieces of showing really, uh, let's say, good, good improvements or hints of nice to drive cars like the Ferrari is, which I think sticks out. I'm just hoping they are able to improve the other other hypercars as well and maybe elevate the LMP2 and GTE experience to a new level there as well, because those, as I said, are still kind of R Factor 2-ish, um, a bit floaty, slidey, not so much to my liking, and you don't really need that in the game because they don't offer anything new this shall be it for the review thanks so much for staying this long and this deep into the video so i'm really hoping this gave you what you were looking for and now you feel able to make your own decision i think it's worth trying the game you can argue about the, the 30 euro price tag for the early set access uh, which we debated earlier where i find the term kind of doesn't apply because essentially it is already r factor 2 and they didn't start from scratch, so I feel it's kind of unwarranted to call it early access. It's, let's say, late access, but not of the final product. But um, we have a good start here, and we'll have to really see what the next weeks bring. If people keep playing it, if more people pick it up, 
or if uh, user numbers are dropping again, because there's one final issue that is there are seven tracks, just a few cars, and with only a few of them really being interesting, I could imagine that it also quickly gets boring again. So they will have to continue bringing more tracks in order to keep people entertained, I feel. And the other problem might just be that the LMDH cars are a bit tricky to drive. Even if you take out all the energy management and learning how the cars in general work, just outside of the driving, the driving itself is quite tricky simply because the cars are really fast and they need very good trail braking in the end for you to drive them safely around the track. They are sensitive to the throttle. And once you set them up a tiny bit loose, you definitely need a direct drive wheel to keep the cars on the road, potentially. So I feel there is a bit of a yeah, high entry barrier for beginnerish or not so good drivers to actually pick up the cars that this game is made for. Um, and that could turn out to be yeah, kind of detrimental to user numbers. But that is all yet to see. Please leave comments if you liked the video. If you absolutely hated it, well, maybe let me also know, but maybe uh, put it uh, in a nice way. And then looking forward to doing more videos of that to dive deeper into certain areas once they exist. Last but not least, we are already working on implementing the more ultimate into our website, popometo.io, where you will be able to A, purchase setups, but more importantly, be able to compare the data to professional drivers out there, which should allow you to very easily see what you are doing different, what you should be doing in order to control the cars and get them around the track in a faster way. It should only be a week or two max and then we'll have it implemented on the website so look out for that because i feel the Le Mans ultimate driving style is certainly a bit different from acc is certainly a bit different from iRacing so make sure if you care about how fast you actually go if you want to level up in the online racing quicker this should be exactly for you and then we'll hope to see you on the site very soon and for more videos as i said earlier for now Goodbye.